My name is Yanis. I'm a professor here, but also I'm a group leader at the Toshiba Labs in Cambridge, UK. And uh, so today I will introduce you to speech production and advanced techniques for speech modeling. So this is the outline. Uh, we will see speech and we will always, many times, we will speak about modulations and modulators. And then we will uh, see classical, uh, classic modeling approaches like the linear prediction. And I'm probably you're not familiar so much with the Saint-Jodel model. And then after we seeing the Saint-Jodel model, we will go one step further to see advanced modeling of speech using adaptive Saint-Jodel models. And there is a big family now of algorithms uh, in that area. Uh, it is the quasi-harmonic model, QHM. It is the adaptive quasi-harmonic model, and what we call lately the extended adaptive quasi-harmonic model. So all these are new models. Some of them have been introduced in the tutorial Interspeech 2012 in Portland, but since then we've made some steps. So today I will show you all the details of this uh, new approach of speech modeling. Okay, so this is um, a simple view of uh, human uh, to human speech communication. And here we see how really the speech is produced. Um, so a very important modulator is this one, which is really the vocal folds. This is a very important modulator. And this is related also to the second part of uh, in the afternoon uh, of the technical discussion today, which is associated to voice pathology. Because the sound that comes out from that first modulator is called voice. Then the signal is traveling, passing through the vocal tract. And this is the filter. This is another modulator. So if you listen to the, to the signal above the first modulator, you cannot recognize if it is A, E, O, but with the appropriate modulation that you learn after, while you are, let's say, two, three years old, uh, how to move your articulators of the vocal tract, then you transform this voice into recognizable sounds like A, O, E, and this is called partially speech. Then, of course, we connect this into words, and then we make and we process with our brain and our ear, and this is language then. Um, then, if we see speech over time, what is uh, the traveling sound here? It is the unvoiced part, like, for example, if this person says shop, then this is the unvoiced part. This is regular oscillations, we call it uh, periodic part or voiced part, and this is impulsive. This, these impulses are produced uh, mostly uh, at the vocal tract. Um, like, there is a, a pressure that is increasing, I have my lips closed, but then at some point I release, and this is producing Now, this, these are the vocal folds, um, and they vibrate uh, when there is invoicing, like here in the left part, um, there is a tension, so there is a vibration, and this vibration uh, we see like a periodic part, I will show you, of the, uh, the airflow, and uh, there is a simplified view of this mechanism with uh, uh, vocal folds opening and closing. Um, while when we are, there is breath, um, these uh, are very relaxed. Why? Because simply we want to maximize the amount of oxygen uh, or the air, let's say, that will uh, come into our lungs. So these are uh, relaxing uh, states. Uh, these are vocal folds vibration, 
the vocal folds, rear vocal folds. And uh, of course, you may know already that the vocal folds uh, vibrate depending on the gender. For males, with, uh, let's say, around 100 times per second, that is the F0 of 100 hertz, or for females, 200 times per second, or 200 hertz, or if you are a child, it is 300 times per second, 300 hertz. Obviously, we cannot, with our eye, we cannot observe this uh, movement simply because we are around to 25 to 30 times per second we can observe. So, of course, we, the, since we undersample, uh, we downsample really the, this, the whole process, the, there is an aliasing effect on the movement of the vocal folds. So now you will see, I hope, yeah, I it will tell me that... Uh, I trust this document. Yeah, uh, there is sound, so I don't know why this has not come out. But let's try again. No, okay. Okay, so that is the vibration, but there is an aliasing effect here. This is a female voice, so you cannot observe 200. Uh, movements per second. You cannot see it unless you slow down and you do what we say with high-speed camera so you will see the movement. But more about that in the afternoon. So these are real vocal folds. Um, now, um, while the vocal folds vibrate, the, we have this what we call glottal airflow velocity. Uh, air passes through, it's modulated by, from the vocal folds, and then uh, if we measure here the amplitude of airflow velocity, there is an area which is, there is no velocity. Again, this is a simplified view. This is called closed phase. The vocal folds are closed. Then they are opening gradually. So gradually the uh, airflow velocity is increasing. And this is the open phase and then decreases fast again, and this is the return phase. Now, it depends on the mass of your uh, vocal folds, uh, how fast uh, the vocal folds will return to the closed phase. And that mass depends, of course, on the gender again. If you are uh, male, uh, your uh, inertia uh, is big. For female, uh, is smaller, and for children is even smaller than the female voices, uh, than the female speakers, then that means uh, your uh, F0, uh, if you are a male, is short, it is uh, small, it is around 100 hertz, 200 hertz for females, etc. And this is because of the mass of the vocal folds. So this point is what we call the glottal closure instant. Uh, and many algorithms in voice pathology, but also in speech technology, like speech synthesis, are based on this glottal closure instant. Not all of them, but many of them. And then we try from the speech signal to find this glottal closure instant. Um, then, uh, of course, the sound, as I said, goes to the second modulator, which are the vocal tract shapes. And then, uh, depending on where are the, uh, the articulators, we can produce vowels, back or front vowels. We can produce plosives. The, you see here, the, um, we stop the air there, and then we release, and then we produce for instance, or with the lips. Um, and then fricatives, so there is uh, th the difference between vowels and fricatives. You see that there is an area here, and because of the Bernoulli effect, uh, there is a noise that is producing here. Um, and this is what we perceive as high frequencies, and these are the sounds like uh, um, sh or f. So this is... Um, in the vocal tract are produced. It's also um, 
not, it's not fricative. Of course, this is, again, uh, simple. We can have uh, voiced uh, oscillations, but uh, not so uh, like in A or O, like B, B. So it, there are also uh, two areas there important, but uh, okay, that is, I don't want to spend more time on this because I'm sure that you have seen in your courses in speech signal, pro in speech signal processing. Um, so then let's come into more into the, uh, how we can model all this process and how then we can go towards the modeling part. So let's assume that the vocal tract, the impulse response is this one. Then if this is um, the excitation signal, as we say, the glottal airflow, then the convolution, uh, sorry. Um, so this is, the, this is the vocal tract, and this is now the excitation of the vocal tract. How we can make the excitation? We can uh, convolve. You may remember this figure. This is the G of N, and the P of N, it is just impulses. And of course, the distance here is one pitch period. So the convolution between the glottal airflow signal and the impulse response of the, of the glottis, of the vocal folds, and this periodic part creates uh, this excitation for the periodic sounds, of course. And then um, by convoluting, assuming that the system is linear, uh, this uh, excitation with the vocal tract, and if we put also a window, then we get the speech signal in time, but we can do Fourier transform, and then we have a time frequency distribution, we, uh, as we call it, short time Fourier transform. Um, and if we see the magnitude spectrum of it, then we see the multiplication of the vocal tract filter and of the glottal uh, system as what we call envelope, spectral envelope. Uh, and these are now the harmonics. The thing is that we do not observe this one. This is not observed, but we only observed these ones. So that means during the speech production, um, because of the periodicity, we sample the spectral magnitude into the harmonic. So we know just these areas. Then there are many algorithms that they try to go from the circles, which are, uh, let's say, samples, discrete samples to the continuous spectral envelope. And this is uh, another research area, um, which is mostly we see it in speech synthesis, but also speech modification. Okay, so now this is uh, the speech signal. This is over time, and this is over frequency. So this is a time frequency plane, and this is just one dimension, time. So we can recognize uh, things that we just said. These are, oh, we can listen to this sound. Unfortunately, this does not work, however, which is very bad. So I hope someone from the uh, people uh, in the support uh, uh, they can found, find out why I don't have sound here. So I think they, they are listening to me, so they will come. So nevertheless, uh, this is an English uh, sound. So you can see here is pe the periodic part, and this is a periodic part, and voice sounds. There are some stops. I cannot write on this because if I click, then uh, you just listen to the sound. And this is the time frequency plane. Or during voicing, like here, you see the, the structure of the formants, which is exactly what we, we mentioned here with the dashed lines. These are the formants, F1, F2, F3. And obviously, these are also, they are not known, the formants. 
because simply we do not have this continuum information over frequency. We have only the discrete part of it, which are the circles, as I mentioned. Uh, so we see this uh, formation of formants, and uh, there are many algorithms that they try also to estimate the formants from that discrete information. Uh, and whenever it is unvoiced, you see that there is uh, high energy in the high frequencies, as it is here, here, and here. And then depending on how, what is your analysis window, you see the periodicity either as vertical lines. I don't know if you can see the vertical lines here. This is wideband analysis, or with vertical lines, which is short, uh, narrow band analysis with uh, using uh, long time windows. Uh, so that depends on the analysis window that we use. Now, if we make a zoom, you, you will see that, as I said, there are regular oscillations, and we see that the, this is a windowed signal, so there is a window here. That's why we have this shape, and the magnitude spectrum of it is this one. So this is over time, this is over frequency. So for regular oscillations, we see that there is a periodicity, and something that we can predict, probably we can predict the signal using previous samples. And also this periodicity, it is shown also in frequency domain. You see that there are some, um, as we say, kind of harmonics, kind of harmonics, which are, uh, there is a structure in the frequency domain. And um, this is how, why we say, oh, that's probably a good idea to have a harmonic model. If we look um, uh, the frequency domain part, if we look in the time domain part, then we say probably linear prediction may be a good model for modeling the speech. Now, if there are no oscillations at the vocal folds, then uh, this is again time, this is frequency. So you see that in the higher frequency, this is frequency, oh. this is frequency, no time. I can, um, so this is frequency. So you see there are there is higher energy in the high frequencies, low energy in the low frequencies. The scale here is in dB. If it is linear, you will not see anything in the low frequencies. Um, so these observations, again, lead us to specific models, like the linear prediction model uh, or uh, the sinusoidal model. So let's start a bit with the linear prediction. So now we move to the classic modeling of speech. Um, so let's assume that the input to the vocal tract system is um, a train of unit samples, as I said, of this glottal signal. Um, so we have an input, we have a system, and then we have an output, which is speech. So then, assuming again that the system is linear, then we can write the equations that connect the output, the input, and the system. Um, we can write also this uh, Z-transform uh, as a Z, Z polynomial, or all this H of Z is uh, this function. And if we go back from the Z domain to the time domain, this is what we get. No, no, this is still, sorry, this is, do I can do that? No. I can remove it. Nevertheless, okay. So this is still Z domain. Now, if we go and we do uh, inverse, inverse Z transform, then we go to the time domain. Now, the time domain shows really that we can write an equation that connects the current sample of speech with the P previous samples of speech. And then there is another term which cause, which is obviously the error of that prediction, because we can write that as a predictor. 
Then if we write it as a predictor, then the question is how to find these coefficients. And then there is uh, the, the terms that we use. Uh, of course, there are linear prediction coefficients, uh, autoregressive, because this is an autoregressive process, and the whole thing linear prediction analysis. Of course, there is, there is advanced linear prediction analysis. We can uh, uh, have not only autoregressive, but also a moving average, and that is the ARMA modeling of speech. Uh, so autoregressive and moving average. Uh, we can consider many options for the excitation signal for, or for the prediction error. We, can, uh, we have two techniques, two major techniques to measure these linear prediction coefficients. One is based on the autocorrelation method and the other is based on the covariance method. The covariance method is more accurate, it's accurate model, but it's not stable. There is no guarantee that your filter that you get, it will be stable. Um, in order to do that, in order to make sure that it is stable, you try to make the analysis during the closed phase. That's why the detection of the closed phase is very important, the one that I just mentioned to you. Um, but this is very hard to detect that, that area from the speech signal. And the covariance method it's good that because it requires just a few samples in order to estimate these autocorrelation coefficients. Uh, not the, sorry, the autoregressive coefficients. The autocorrelation method, on the other hand, is stable. We can really make sure that the filter that we estimate is stable. However, it requires more samples in order to estimate it. And we can show that if that window, the length of the window goes to infinity, then we can uh, estimate these coefficients, uh, AK, with um, uh, high accuracy. But then, of course, we have to model a long uh, speech signal, but speech signal, the speech signal really changes fast. So we cannot have long window. Always we have to have short time analysis. And consider there that the filter is linear, time invariant, in order to write down all these equations about uh, convolution. Otherwise, these equations are not valid. So this is uh, the analysis part where we estimate the coefficients of the filter. Uh, here you can see this is the predictor. So we predict uh, speech at time n. We, then we measure the error and this is the prediction error. This is a very important step because then we can use this error here to, uh, uh, as an input to the 1 over AZ uh, filter, which is the prediction uh, error filter, in order to synthesize back speech. And based on this simple uh, approach, we had uh, models uh, developed uh, in the past like the LPC-10, which has been used for, uh, uh, for um, military, uh, uh, mostly uh, applications. Um, it's a low bandwidth uh, speech coders, but also uh, by making more and more um, sophisticated uh, this uh, excitation signal, then we ended up with uh, algorithms like KELP or MELP, and these are now the state-of-the-art systems are, that are used in your cell phones. So it started with these simple approaches, but now uh, making a bit more sophisticated this part, the code uh, excited for recent linear prediction, KELP, um, it is how your cell phone works. I must say that the linear prediction has a problem also for female voices does not work so well for female voices as it works for male voices. So I can ask you later on why. So uh, I just said that if these are the coefficients that we, uh, we have for the linear prediction coefficients, if this LK are equal to the AK, which is the uh, autoregressive coefficients, then we have a chance to synthesize speech. And then in the standard linear prediction synthesis, we have to separate if the 
the excitation signal will be a periodic impulse strain and, um, or one impulse, a periodic in order to produce voiced speech, an impulse in order to produce the stop sounds like t, k, p, and uh, white noise if we have to uh, synthesize sounds like sh, f, etc. So that makes it a bit complicated. That's why people develop this kelp, for instance, uh, algorithm. But there is another approach. Uh, still, it is under classic modeling. To how all these parts, the periodic impulse train, the just an impulse, or white noise, can we uh, really unify this excitation into one model? And this is the generation of the sinusoidal and harmonic models. Oh, but before we go there, sorry. Uh, so you see here the original speech signal. And then this is synthesized using this simple linear prediction. And the linear prediction, in order to, since this is an autoregressive filter, this is a minimum phase filter. And if you excite it with just impulses, this is what you get. So this is a minimum phase signal. Uh, and it is the minimum phase version of the original signal shown here on the left. So there is a big difference. And actually, how does it sound? It sounds quite buzzy. Why it sounds buzzy? Why this is not, this does not sound buzzy? Because this minimum phase property increases in a non-natural way the correlation between the samples. And this unnatural high correlation, it is perceived as buzziness. OK, so this is about this linear prediction. And then we go to the sinusoidal models, which they try to uh, unify this um, excitation signal uh, using sinusoids. So we will see how the sinusoidal model can be seen as a source filter model, as it is the linear prediction model. First, let me introduce the main sinusoidal model. This is the main uh, model. These are the complex amplitudes. This, from that, we can get the magnitude, if we take the abs, or if we the phase information, uh, which is using angle. For instance, and this is, these are the frequencies of the sinusoids. In short, a sinusoidal model is defined by two parameters, complex amplitudes and frequencies. Then, if we make a restriction of the frequencies to be harmonics, so fk is k times f0, then we call this harmonic model. And then, of course, we have to estimate these parameters. And this is done by projecting S, which is the speech signal, into a space generated by these basis functions. Either these are sinusoids or restricted, constrained sinusoids to be harmonics, which are these two. So F, then, it is a space, and it is represented from, uh, by these basis functions. And then projecting S onto that, we get gamma, which are the complex uh, amplitudes. Um, and or another way to see it, we minimize the mean squared error between the original uh, speech, which is this one, and the model X. So now, how the sinusoids go with the source and filter? This is the source. So again, we think that these are sinusoids, sample, uh, sum of sinusoids. And then these are the excitation phase, which is an integral of the instantaneous frequency plus a phase, which accounts, uh, we call it phase offsets, which uh, delays the individual uh, components in order to reconstruct either an impulse or noise or a periodic part. Um, and then the filter uh, has also a magnitude information and a phase, a system phase information. 
Now, assuming that we, the filter does not change over time, so it is linear and time invariant, then again the convolution operation can be applied, and then this combined, it uh, give us the speech file, a model for the speech file, where the amplitudes, it's just the multiplication of the excitation amplitude with the system amplitude, while the phase that we measure is the sum of the two components, of the excitation phase and the system phase. Now, again, we assume that the signal is stationary because our analysis window is small. Then that means these instantaneous amplitudes, frequencies, uh, and even also the number of harmonics that we use are constant during the analysis window. Under that assumption, then very easily we can show that the instantaneous phase is just this equation, which is a linear function of frequency. Then by putting this into our uh, model and by, measure, by calling this gamma of k, which is the complex amplitude in terms of magnitude and phase, then that leads to the model that you, I shown you uh, two slides before. We are now just using omega k, which is 2 pi multiplied by fk that we have seen in the previous slides. Okay? And uh, how we do this, I can, uh, we can talk if you have uh, questions about that, but uh, mainly we can show that a maximum likelihood actually approach, it is just provides a very simple solution based on peak picking. We, we see the magnitude spectrum here for voiced and for unvoiced sounds. Just we do peak picking, we take the local maxima, and that defines both the frequencies and the complex amplitude in terms of phase and frequencies. Of course, because you have a relatively low resolution, you try to uh, increase the resolution of your Fourier transform, and this is one technique called quadratic interpolated Fourier transform, uh, which has been suggested in 2005 around from Stanford uh, University. And we will see it in the hands-on uh, session, and we will be compared uh, against the standard Sanjodor model and also the adaptive models. So, uh, then synthesis, we can do it with overlap add. We can generate sin uh, the sinusoidal, just the sum of uh, sinusoid as uh, it is shown in the previous slides. And then uh, different frames, overlap add, and this is how we generate speech. Another way to do it uh, is to try to track uh, the frequency, to do tracking of the frequencies over time. And this is what we call uh, a process from death and birth, because and and continuation. Then, uh, then, using that, we can make associations of frequency components from frame to frame. And once we do this association, then we can also associate. We can find a rule how to go from one frame to the next one in terms of amplitudes or in terms of phases, because these are the two components that we need to interpolate. For amplitudes, linear interpolation is the simplest way. For phase, we can use also linear interpolation, which means that the frequency is constant, or f um, second degree uh, polynomial, which means that we, le lead, we let f uh, frequency to be a first polynomial over time, or a third polynomial, and this is what we call cubic phase interpolation that has been suggested in 1985 from Macaulay and Quatieri from MIT um, in a very nice paper, and this is part of this work. And you can see now the reconstruction. This is the original and the reconstructed it's not a, a typical signal. This actually has diplophonia. You can see that with a secondary excitation between the major excitations. These are the major excitations or the glottal closure instance. 
And then there is a secondary excitation or like a secondary um, uh, glottal closure instant, and this is what we call diplophonia. So it's a very difficult signal to model, but the sinusoidal model, as you can see by comparing the two uh, waveforms, is doing a very good job. Of course, it's not minimum phase. It's mixed phase, the construction. So we cannot really s uh, compare the two techniques, uh, the linear prediction and the sinusoidal model, directly. Uh, so, uh, and the harmonic model, again, is, since we talked about that, is simply having multiples. The FK uh, will be K times F0, and F0 we call it fundamental frequency or pitch. Now, that uh, obviously it's very good, be simply because we don't need to estimate FK, just F0. But, of course, as you know already, nothing comes uh, easily in life. So even if we say F0, okay, we just need F0, then you need an algorithm to estimate F0. And you may have seen hundreds of algorithms estimated F0. And they work okay. But look at that. This is a magnitude spectrum. And obviously, if you make a mistake in F0, then uh, you will pay uh, that. Uh, by not modeling well your signal. Here you see in the low frequencies where there is no really an error between the continuum line, which is the original speech, and the dashed line, which is the harmonic model. But in the high frequencies, if you can see from where you sit, there is um, uh, um, uh, the, the, the two maxima are not really aligned, and, we, and this is because there are small errors in F0. If now we try to improve these errors, then we improve also the modeling in these frequencies. Now, what, how do we perceive the error in F0? Simple errors, small errors, like this one, the first one. Simply, we do not model enough energy of the signal. So, and that means the signal has as we call lack of presence. So when we listen to the signal, it's, like, it's not like the original signal being next to us, but a bit farther, simply because it does not have the, um, most of the energy of the signal modeled because of these F0 estimations. OK, so now this gives us enough motivation to go towards the adaptive sinusoidal model and see even if there are mistakes in F0, even if, if there are mistakes in FK, even if your analysis window is very small, how you can do really um, sinusoidal modeling? And this is uh, uh, and this is what we call adaptive sinusoidal models. Um, do, but do you have any questions so far? You know everything, so um, I'm sorry to repeat things that you know. Here, okay, please. Yes. How does that differ from? Um, yeah. Uh, first of all, when we measure the phase from the signal, this is already mixed phase. Um, so the mixed phase means we can, of course, the phase can be uh, factorized uh, with different terms, like all pass phase, all pass, or, or minimum phase, uh, or maximum phase and minimum phase. All, all these, when they are combined, are the mixed phase. So what we measure in speech is the mixed phase. That means we measure as well minimum phase and maximum phase. Or we measure also all pass information and minimum phase. Now, if we go to the linear prediction system, because it is autoregressive model, uh, this is a minimum phase system because all the poles and all the zeros of the system is inside the unit circle. And that makes the system stable. If you want to measure the maximum phase, you have to put some information outside the unit circle. But then you have problems on how to estimate that and how to keep the system being, let's say, stable uh, in, during the estimation process. 
I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Are you familiar with the Saint Jadon model? More or less? Okay. Uh, so let me then go introduce you to the adaptive Saint Jadon model, and you will have hands on in the afternoon. Please come, where you will, using MATLAB, you will see uh, these adaptive Saint Jadon models, how do they perform, and how they are. Um, um, compared to the standard Saint-Judal model or even the quadratic interpolated Fourier transform from Stanford. Okay, so this equation, the first one, shows you again the Saint-Judal model. Here you have the complex amplitudes, the frequencies, and this is the window that we put in order to have a short time analysis and estimate the amplitudes and the frequencies. Now, the methods that we have in order to estimate these are FFT-based, which we call them non-parametric approaches, like the quadratic infor uh, interpolated fast Fourier transform from uh, Abbey, uh, um, from Stanford University. Um, and I'm trying to remember now the professor, but anyway, it will come later. Um, Julius O. Smith, which is quite famous in uh, music, uh, signal processing, but also speech signal processing. Uh, so Julius O. Smith. And um, we have then uh, parametric approaches, subspace methods. And uh, Denmark is quite strong in that. Uh, they, uh, in Albert, uh, there is a lot of work on subspace methods and least squares methods. And then also then I can add also Bayesian methods, how to estimate the uh, Saint Jodel parameters. Nevertheless, always there is a mismatch. We can, uh, we should be naive, really very naive, if we consider that these frequencies are really um, the frequencies that we estimate are the real frequencies of the signal. Um, that's why we will consider next that the frequency here, the real frequency, what we measure and the distance, there is an error. And the key he here is to estimate that error. If we estimate well the frequencies, then we will see the mechanism to estimate again the amplitudes, even in noisy conditions, even despite this frequency error. And that will give us the adaptive Saint Jodel model. Okay, so now, instead of this, Fk, we have F hat k, which is the frequencies that we measure, which have an error. So then that. In order to address this point, we rely not on the Fourier transform, but what we call the Prony. Uh, the Prony uh, published his uh, work in 1795. Then it has been revisited sometimes, but it, uh, after that, of course. But um, a big, really, step uh, happened in 1999 when Jean Laroche in France. Uh, revisited the Prony model. And then uh, Laroche was one of my supervisors when I was a PhD student in France, and I studied with him the Prony model, and we produced some outputs for speech synthesis, voice conversion, uh, things like that, based on uh, partially quasi-harmonic model. At that, mon at that time, we knew that this model is very powerful, but because it was so powerful, we did not know what to do with that. So then we ended up with simplified versions uh, of it. And uh, then during my thesis, we have produced three models. One of them was the quasi-harmonic model. And then some, another simplified version called harmonic plus noise model, H&M, that has been used uh, a lot in uh, speech synthesis and also speech modifications. And then there was another model, which is not used 
uh, at the moment, but has a bit, big potential as well to be used. But nevertheless, then my PhD student, Giannis Pandazis, tried mm. again to revisit the model to see why, why the model is so powerful. What is the model? The model is that just you augment this information, AK, by this term, where T is time. So you can see then BK as a complex slope. All these are complex values. Then, if we consider one component, and we see that in the frequency domain, and W is the Fourier transform of the analysis window, then that uh, one component can be written, this one, in the frequency domain, like that, where AK is the standard complex amplitude, and BK is the complex uh, slope. Then the key idea here is to decompose BK uh, uh, in terms of AK, one perpendicular to AK and one parallel to AK. Then we can uh, show that XKF can be written in this way by considering this uh, projection of BK over AK. Then um, we take into account, we make um, the development uh, using Taylor of the Fourier transform of the window around this FK. And the uh, Taylor series development is these three terms, where you see that the, there is a, a third term which depends on this rho 2 and the second derivative of the Fourier transform of the window, the second derivative of the frequency of the uh, Fourier transform of the window. Now, if this is small, so we can throw it away, then we can write XK of F, XK of F from here like that, where we don't use this parameter. Now, when that term is small, it turns out, first of all, that has rho 2. So when that error between the, the rho 2, we will show that it is really related to the error that we make in the frequency domain. So if that rho 2 is small, small error, then that term is small as well. Also, if the analysis window it is, has uh, small duration, smaller is the duration of the analysis window, smaller will be the derivative, the second derivative of the window at the frequencies fk hat. So, in short, we require small error, which is, okay, uh, a wish, but also a small window. Bigger is the window, and remember that for the, your hands-on session, bigger is the window, um, less valid is this assumption. Okay, so then we found previously that this is the component. Then we go back to the time domain. And then initially we assume this. Our FK is the FK hat, which are uh, the frequencies that we want, plus the error. So if we compare uh, these two, forget this term at the moment. If, we, if you compare this part and this part, then you make an association between the error that we are looking for, which is eta, and this rho 2. In short, that BK provides a mechanism under some assumptions of estimating the frequency error, eta k, for each k. So in other words, this is what we suggest. Let's see how we can use this. Okay, so 
Very important to know, again, is are the constraints that we have put. This shows, again, the Taylor series expansion of the Fourier transform of the window around Fk and rho 2 divided by 2 pi. So what we would like to have, these are what I have just said, but because of my Greek accent, it's better to see it written as well. So we want small value of the second derivative of the Fourier transform of the window at frequency fk. Um, and then this is because this, of course, has an influence. The length of the window has an influence of that value. And because the secondary derivative, uh, it's easy to show for a rectangular window, it is analog to the uh, um, window length uh, power 3 cubic. So what we would like to have is short analysis window. This is not bad result, actually, because speech is non-stationary. If I would say we require very long analysis window, then that will be a drawback. Because during that long window, many things change. While now, we say, no, we require short analysis window. So we can do really good analysis. And this is a very important result using very short time windows. Obviously, however, long analysis windows, we know that they provide robustness going from one frame to the other. Because if you, for instance, you make very short your analysis windows and you make an analysis here and later on, then these two estimations, they do not have any connection between them. So it's very difficult then to regenerate the speech during speech synthesis, for instance. So the length of the analysis window has obviously, as you know, in the signal process from the signal processing courses, connection with the bandwidth. Then we can relate, we can find what is the connection between the bandwidth of the analysis window and the error. So in order to see the influence of, of that was the influence of the window, now we will go to see the second term. You remember, W was one factor that influences our assumption of Taylor series expansion. The other was the mistake, the frequency mismatch. So this slide shows the influence of the frequency mismatch. So let's assume that this is the model, the saint jordan model, for one component. And this is the quasi-harmonic model again. So with just one uh, uh, component, we can write a least square solution in order to get A and B as a function of the magnitude spectrum and also of this eta, which is the mistake. So by projecting B into A and find these uh, coefficients, rho 2, we can show that that frequency mismatch has this form. Now, let's plot this in order to see its, uh, how it performs. So this is the frequency mismatch, in short, that the algorithm can tolerate for a rectangular window. Let me make a zoom here. For a rectangular window and dashed for a humming window. So that means if your algorithm, if you, if you make mistakes, around 0 hertz from, let's say, minus 50 to 50, there is secure, you are secure from the algorithm that the error that you will find, the error that you will find, uh, you will find the frequency mismatch, and the error will be 0. But if you are in this area, then there is no guarantee that your algorithm will find the error the frequency mismatch. So here, let's say, around 80 hertz. But if you use humming window, that I am saying the bandwidth of the window plays a role, then you extend that area even towards, to have even a mismatch of 100 hertz.
then, then QHM has a mechanism since, okay, you make a first assumption of the frequencies, you estimate the amplitudes, then you can iterate this. You can use your new estimations as initial points, then you re-estimate amplitudes. From the uh, amplitudes, you can find a new frequency mismatch, you correct the frequencies, you estimate amplitudes, etc. So, in, in short, QHM not only can correct the frequency, the frequencies, but has a mechanism to apply that in an iterative way. While sinusoidal model with peak picking, if you do peak picking, that's it. You don't have a mechanism to update that information. So, if we do iterations, as it is shown here, so we can improve even further. The dashed line is with two iterations. Solid line is um, with uh, no iteration. So here, for instance, there is a problem in this area. You see, you start increasing. Uh, your estimation is not good. However, if you do iterations, like two iterations, the error, even in these areas, around 150 hertz, uh, then still you can estimate the original frequencies. So um, the, we, we found then that we can uh, reduce uh, the, the bias that exists, that this mismatch can be removed if that bias is smaller than the bound width of the window uh, or, um, divided by three. So if you are in that area, there is a guarantee that the algorithm will find the frequencies. And although you give initial frequencies which are wrong, the algorithm will correct you using, of course, the mean square error criterion and this, the Prony representation. Now, uh, before going into make, put uh, problems into the system like adding noise to see what is going on. Okay, if I make a frequency mistake, it is shown here mathematically that you can get the estimations. You can get the real frequencies using the quasi-harmonic model. But if I make the case more difficult, if I add noise into the speech, can you estimate the frequencies then? So that is uh, the next topic, using the quasi-harmonic model, but on noisy signals now. Hmm? So not only you have a, a, a wrong frequency estimator, but on top of that, you have noise. But I think we need break. So we will make five, to five minutes break, and then we will come back to see how to use quasi-harmonic model, this advanced speech modeling technique in noisy environments as well. Okay, thank you for your attention. Okay, so we will continue the, uh, the course. So we have seen that the algorithm uh, is able to estimate uh, the mistakes in frequencies, correct them. And now we will see if we add noise, what happens. So now the model is that we have the sinusoids and noise, and we make the experiment with four components, just to be able to measure uh, quickly and fast. Uh, and we have a mean squared error in terms of frequencies and in terms of amplitudes. And we will make comparison with the Kramer Rao lower bounds and uh, the qua quadratic interpolated fast Fourier transform. And uh, we do that with Monte Carlo simulations. So these are the results in terms of frequencies. So you see here this line, the, the dark black line, shows the uh, Kramer Rao lower bound. Um, these, the triangulars are with the fast Fourier transform, 
or the quadratic interpolated fast Fourier transform. Uh, these are with QHM but without iterations. And this is when we start making iterations. So you see, after three iterations, we really reach the Kramer Rao lower bound for frequency one, two, three, four, etc. So uh, these frequencies have been uh, selected. So some of them they are very close, some of them they are apart uh, in order to make that experiment. So there is a paper later on in the references that you can read in the transactions about details. Now, um, the, in terms of amplitudes, that was about frequencies, also for amplitudes, the estimation, you can see that QHM with three iterations, which is this one, with the circles, again, it is very successful uh, in estimating the amplitudes. So that means, uh, that means that QHM is able and it is robust against estimation mistakes, like providing wrong FK, as well against additive noise. We have not tested on convolutive noise. But in QHM, there is an approximation. So that approximation is valid under the assumptions that I, pro I gave to you, I shown to you in the first part, and we have to respect also to relate the frequency mismatch mismatches with the bandwidth of the analysis window. We have shown that the AQHM is robust against noise, and it can be shown, if I have time, I will show to you, that QHM, it is equivalent to, or approximately, to the Gauss-Newton method, and that there is a relationship between this frequency estimation that we make with quasi-harmonic model and the reassigned spectrogram. I have some slides on these two parts. I think we will start now, okay, the Gauss-Newton method. So, Regarding the Gauss-Newton method, we have n samples of this signal. It is, again, with one component. W is the analysis window. C is the complex amplitude. Omega is the frequency. Then Gauss-Newton algorithm also provides a mechanism to correct the frequencies. And it is shown that the update mechanism follows this equation. Now, let's compare this with the quasi-harmonic model. The quasi-harmonic model make this assumption. Instead of just C, it adds one more component, that B. So, estimates B, project B onto C, and then one of the projection, row 2, is used to correct the frequencies. So this row two, it is, so it is exactly what I just said. It is the projection, the vertical projection of B onto the C. And B can be shown to be this one. It is estimated in this way. So now if you compare these two, very easily you can see that actually the two algorithms are the same. And this is what we say approximate Gauss-Newton solution of frequency. Now, if we do uh, a root mean squared error for frequency and we compare the Gauss-Newton method, which is the blue line, and the red line, which is the iterative quasi-harmonic model, that, that means the quasi-harmonic model but with iterations, then we see that they are very close, as expected, based on the equations that i just shown to you. And after some iterations, they um, arrive to the Kramer-Rao uh, lower bound, this CRB. And this is um, 
For the frequency estimations, we have two frequencies probably here. And this is for the amplitude. But here we have, um, with SNR 0 dB, okay, all, always we have SNR 0 dB. So that means we have noisy signal, same power, the signal with uh, the noise. And as you can see, after some iterations, we uh, reach the Kramer Rao lower bound. Now, regarding the connection between the quasi harmonic model and what we call reassigned spectrogram, reassigned spectrogram has been suggested by Patrick Flandrin from in France, and is considered today one of the most successful time frequency distributions, time frequency representations of non stationary sounds. So let's see if there is any connection and how. By making that comparison, we can gain some knowledge and introduce it to the quasi-harmonic model. So, mainly the reassigned spectrogram, by taking the derivative over the, the phase spectrum, can uh, relocate where you do your analysis in terms of time and frequency. And these are the two equations in, in terms of time relocation and the frequency relocation. That means taking reassigned spectrogram takes just the short time for your transform and then relocates the information that we see on the short time for your transform. It relocates that information but using the phase information. So this is how the reassigned spectrogram uh, does the job and it's very, very successful. So let's see now the connection with the quasi-harmonic model. Unfortunately, you have to remember some slides before, but okay, I will try to go back and forth so to make the, the, um, the connection clear to you, hopefully. So again, this is the quasi-harmonic model. This is a projection of B onto A. This is A again. And it can be shown that uh, the relocation between, in terms of time, if we, we want also to make a relocation over time and uh, frequency, it is actually the same as in the reassigned spectrogram if <clears throat> we weight the rho2, which is the frequency estimator, the, the frequency mismatch estimator with this uh, ratio of the moments of the analysis window. In case that the analysis window is Gaussian, it can be shown analytically that by considering um, uh, W2 and W0 uh, moments, the zero and the second moment of the window, then if you weight the frequency mismatch by this ratio, then you end up to the same relocation of frequency as in reassigned spectrogram. Same thing, uh, this is the first time now that you see row one into the place. Row one we, it has not been used in all the previous slides before. And this is related to kind of the slope over time. So that slope over time shows you an information uh, which is related to what we call group delay or where to relocate the energy of the signal over time. So it is a time relocation mechanism again. And it is shown again that if we weight that with this ratio okay, in terms of Gaussian windows, then we arrive to the same relocation property as the reassigned spectrogram. In short, quasi-harmonic model and reassigned spectrogram, they have the same mechanism if we weight this row one and row two by these two terms. Now, that gives us a, a, an idea 
on how to weight probably our win our analysis uh, our speech file not with the window itself but by the derivative the first derivative over time of the window function because if we do so then <clears throat> we show that we improve further the what we call the reassigned spectrogram quasi-harmonic model and this is shown here I will make a zoom using again the bandwidth of uh, the window I think this is for a, a Gaussian window first of all and this is uh, when we do the iterative approach uh, of quasi-harmonic model and this is when we weight the time uh, domain signal speech signal with the derivative the first derivative of our analysis window so you see for instance that there are areas which we make mistakes we start seeing really because imagine these are in Hertz 1000 Hertz so here it could be like 200 Hertz mistake but you see that if we use the reassigned spectrogram then the error is much, much smaller. Hmm? So not only we made a connection with the real science spectrogram, but we gained some knowledge and we transferred that knowledge from the real science spectrogram to the quasi-harmonic model. Okay. So that was the quasi-harmonic model. But we do one step further, and we go to what we call adaptive quasi-harmonic model, or adaptive sinusoidal model now. So the quasi-harmonic model still makes assumptions about the stationarity. Yes, you can find, you can retrieve, you can really re-estimate the frequencies. But still, you make the assumption that your signal, even in that low and um, uh, short analysis window, it is stationary. But this is, again, a strong assumption for speech. So the question is how we can move from the stationary assumption to the non-stationary assumption, to an adaptive way. And this is done, the key th here, <coughs> are these, these frequencies, these base functions, excuse me. So if I change, these are stationary functions, and this is where the stationarity comes, partially. If I modify it and I make this dynamic over time, then also my base functions now are adaptive to the speech signal. Because that phi k tilde, it is estimated from the speech, which is the frequency, the phase information. So then you make your base functions adaptive to the speech signal, to the local properties. Uh, graphically, the difference between quasi-harmonic model and adaptive quasi-harmonic model is the following. This is the quasi-harmonic model. And this is, let's say, the initial estimation. This is the real value, and we try to estimate the difference, the mismatch, and this is row two. But during the analysis window, everything is constant. Now, in the adaptive part, this is not anymore a line, a straight line, but can move over time. And that makes the adaptation. So, of course, in order to do that, there are many uh, ways to, um, to make it. And uh, one is to make interpolations between estimations, so, or no interpolation between the estimations. So that means that depends on the frame rate in the quasi-harmonic model. That means one straightforward way is to go from quasi-harmonic model to the adaptive one, sample by sample. Or you can do an estimation at some point, 
Then an estimation later on with, let's say, three, four, five milliseconds apart. And then between the two estimations, you make an assumption on how this information evolves over time. And this is uh, graphically, again, how the system works. So these are, uh, I don't know if you can see it, there is a black line and a gray line. The black line is um, uh, the estimated and the instantaneous frequency. No, one is the true frequency and the other is the estimated. Now you will see step by step how we move from the estimated, initial estimated, to uh, true uh, instantaneous frequency. So this is, let's say, QHM, and then we do adaptation. Look how close now we are into the uh, true uh, instantaneous frequency. And with the second iteration, we are basically very, very close. We do some experiments. <laughs> For instance, we have uh, a, a signal that we know well what is the evolution over time of the amplitude information and evolution of over time of the frequency modulation. In short, we have an AM-FM model uh, using just one component. And this is the way, a, a deterministic way, that the amplitude evolves over time and the phase. Then we introduce a frequency mismatch of 35 hertz, and we use Hamming window. And we compare that with the standard sine journal model in terms of the amplitude modulation error and the frequency modulation error in terms of hertz. So the quasi-harmonic model, if we, uh, we do analysis every 10 milliseconds, so this is uh, compare the quasi-harmonic model with this um, estimation of uh, the mechanism to estimate the frequencies. And this is the sinusoidal model with 10 milliseconds frame rate. So the frame rate from the first and the second is the same. Um, and AQHM also uses the same frame rate, 10 milliseconds. However, it uses the first estimation from QHM makes a spline interpolation of amplitude and frequency information estimations and then changes the base functions. Then the system adapts very well to the input speech signal, to the input signal, which is not speech right now, it is um, this signal. And then you see the advantage of this adaptation if you compare uh, the, mis the, the error that we make in terms of amplitude <coughs> and uh, frequency in hertz. So adaptation is very important. So then based on that, we can, starting from the quasi-harmonic model, we can <coughs> generate then instantaneous parameters, both for amplitude, phase, and frequency. And this is the way to estimate the, uh, the amplitudes. This is the phase. So now you see how we introduce into the equations this BK. And uh, here is how we uh, track the frequencies. <coughs> so in short, that means that the, from the quasi-harmonic model, we go one step further to uh, advanced speech, and not only speech, music, in general, signal modeling using a high-resolution AM-FM modeling of, of the signal. So that's the key words that you have to have in mind. So this is a high-resolution AM-FM signal modeling. Okay, so that is the AM-FM part. Um, here we show again by, this is any AM-FM signal. In order to support that really your representation, it is an AM-FM representation, you have to 
put together your model and the standard AMFM model and see how these two things are connected. So this slide is about this connection. So this is a standard AMFM model. Then F, phi K, which is the F uh, phase, uh, we can make a Taylor series expansion, and this is uh, the equation. Um, the instantaneous frequency, which is the derivative of this, divided by 2 pi, is this one. If we consider t equals to 0, that means t equals 0 is your center of your analysis window. So at the center of your analysis window, the instantaneous frequency is given by this one of any AMFM model. And previously, we had that the instantaneous frequency at the center of our analysis window, it is whatever we assume as initial estimations plus this row 2. In short, we suggest that this row 2 is equal to this phi k1, which can be used here uh, in order to write the the model as an AMFM model. Now, how does this, if we apply that, because we saw, we saw this in, onto synth, uh, synthetic signals. How does it work on real signals? Here is the original speech. Original speech over time. This is the reconstruction error after you do quasi-harmonic model. This is what you do when you have sinusoidal model. So you see that the error that you do uh, for the sinusoidal model is much higher than the quasi-harmonic model. But very important, when you do adaptive, the reconstruction error is really very, very small. So adaptation is a very important part. Okay, so that means we can reconstruct speech using our AMFM model. That is what I just said, the high resolution AMFM modeling of speech. Okay, if we apply it on real speech files from TIMIT, and we applied on five minutes from 20 female and male voiced speech, then this is the signal-to-error reconstruction ratio in dB in, uh, for male, female, for the quasi-harmonic model, and for the sinusoidal model, as well for the adaptive quasi-harmonic model using three iterations. So you see really that we have a big improvement in terms of dB. Do you know what is the value of the signal to reconstruction error ratio that above that value you cannot distinguish the original signal from the reconstructed signal? Huh? Huh? Sorry? 30. Another person. 40. Higher you go, of course, you are more uh, <laughs> secure that you uh, 30, 40, other person. Of course, it depends on the capability of, the, of our hearing system, eh? how sensitive we are, how, uh, how much uh, we are um, used to listen to reconstructed speech, original speech, and compare. Okay, for uh, a person who has listened to many singles, signals and tried to compare and identify differences, it's 25 dB. Above 25 dB, I don't think there is a human uh, ear that can distinguish between the original and the reconstructed. So in order to understand also perceptually these numbers, because these numbers may mean nothing if you don't know that threshold. Okay, so <laughs> now we go one step even farther and we say, well, Okay, we did it QHM. We did it adaptive QHM. 
Now we are going to do an extended adaptive quasi-harmonic model. What is this extension? This extension, it is motivated by the following fact. First, we say that, look, these are adaptation. That means the base functions are adaptive to the signal. Okay, but still you have an amplitude information which is deterministic, which you impose the, the rule, how the information will evolve over time. Then the question is, can you make that also adaptive? And this is the extended. And this is uh, by adding this part here. Of course, then these two parts, one and two, can be combined. However, you want to, to have it analytically, that means factorization of these two information, in order to estimate it um, nicely, simply because you have a quasi-harmonic model that provides you the first one. So if you combine them together, you may not have that capability. So the non-parametric uh, adaptive amplitude information it is simply introduced by this alpha of t. Okay, here I, I will not, because that is another lot of information and many steps to develop that, but we will see the result of it. And on, during the hands-on version, the, the hands-on session, you will touch also your hands, you will put your hands on also the extended quasi-harmonic, adaptive quasi-harmonic model. It's getting more and more longer now. Okay, so let's see for two components. This is amplitude modulation one, amplitude modulation two, frequency modulation one, frequency modulation two. The true is the solid line. The dashed is the estimated part. You see here how the FM part of the adaptive, adaptive quasi-harmonic model, how well we do with the frequency modulation. We really track nicely the frequencies, the instantaneous frequencies. But we cannot say the same thing for the amplitude information. As you can see here, there is an error for the amplitude. So then this is the key, and that was the motivation to suggest the extended version of that. And this is now the same signal towards the extended version of it. So again, frequencies are nice as previously, but now we do a better estimation of amplitudes because of this alpha of t that we introduced into the system. In short, this extended quasi-harmonic model, extended adaptive quasi-harmonic model, it is considered today as the state-of-the-art high-resolution, high-accurate AM-FM modeling of speech, and also other signals. Now, how does this compare if we compare original speech, adaptive and extended adaptive? So you, if, you can see, if you see these two signals, one, two, and three, they look the same, actually. If you listen to them, since the, the, the error is above 25 dB, the reconstruction uh, the the construction error ratio is above 25 dB, as I mentioned before to you, you cannot really distinguish so easily the differences. But if you look at the time, you see that this model, which is the extended version, has much lower error than this one. And all over the place. Now, uh, uh, sometimes these things, I think it's just a bug now here, because you have to initiate the first window but once you do that, then you progressively, because you don't know, you cannot make adaptation since you don't know really the evolution of the information before. So the first analysis windows may have some mistakes. But obviously, the signal never starts with like that. It starts probably with silence and then comes to speech. So you, you have time to adapt. Now, where that is important, it is easily shown because it's not so... It's not so easily shown on, during voiced parts, but it is very easily shown in where you have non-stationary uh, parts, highly non-stationary. And where is that? 
during, for instance, stop sounds. Look at this. This is original sound of T. This is the representation of that with a nice sinusoidal model. This information shown in the red, inside the red circle, is called pre-echo. That means there is energy distributed over time towards the past. That means that actually when you listen to that sound, that T is not well represented. It's not so easily shown into our ear. And that has consequences on the intelligibility of the sound and the quality of the sound in general. Now, this is the adaptive quasi-harmonic model. So you see we do much better than the sinusoidal reconstruction, but still there is some pre-echo. But this is nice. You see, you have a strong uh, start point. And then when we go to the extended, there is no any more pre-echo. How we do it? We do it, but let's look the individual components. And this, the dashed line, is the time of the release of the pressure when we say when we do the release, it is the dashed line. Look at this for the sinusoidal model for the adaptive quasi-harmonic model and for the extended adaptive model. So you see that really just before the release, there is no mainly energy in any of our base functions. So more or less, the base functions have weight nearly to zero. And then when there is a release, abruptly, the weight is getting much higher. And this is the recreation of this abrupt, or as we say in the speech production mechanism, release. OK? Now, we tested on many sounds, uh, like poo, tu, ku, boo, etc., in uh, small and large databases, and this is large-scale evaluation. And you see now, in terms of the signal to reconstruction error ratio in dB, the error for uh, just focusing on these parts for the sinusoidal model, for the adaptive quasi-harmonic model, and the extended adaptive quasi-harmonic model. So you see really a big difference because of this extended adaptation that means the weight of our Diproni uh, amplitude with alpha of t. So key papers to read in order to understand more um, all this theory. It is from, of course, the Sinusoidal model from Macaulay and Quatuary. That is in a, a 1986 transaction paper. Then there is a paper in the transactions for what we call the adaptive sinusoidal model from my uh, ex-PhD student, Yanis Padazis. Then there are two interesting papers. No, three interesting papers. These are connected. It's, it is actually a discussion between our group and Peter Stoika group. Uh, through publication, we sent it to signal processing letter. The reviewer was Peter Stoika. So he asked some questions and he said, okay, I'm Peter Stoika. So uh, and then uh, his questions have been published as well. Then we have to make comments on, on that. And that it is where we started to see the Gaussian-Newton connection because he made some comments about that looks like a Gaussian-Newton method, so I like to see if you have any connection between the two methods. And this discussion between us and Peter Stoikas, uh, who is well known in uh, frequency estimation and many other signal processing, uh, his, uh, his team is very good, uh, he has been recorded into these three signal processing letters. Um, the extended adaptive, or I forgot actually to mention it here, the extended adaptive uh, sinusoidal model 
quasi harmonic model from my ex PhD student. He just uh, made uh, his um, um, vi vi uh, Viva Defense, PhD Defense, uh, Yoros Kafedzis, has been published in uh, various. Uh, conference papers, and he is writing, hopefully, now a journal paper on that. Uh, but in collaboration with Gilles Decotex, a next also postdoc uh, who was here for about two years, we made a paper on how this quasi harmonic model can go back to an adaptive harmonic model. So just using harmonics. So that means everything in the um, uh, full band speech, even high frequencies, or if it is just uh, unvoiced, still, if we have harmonics, we can do it very well, especially if it is adaptive. So then, that means that goes back, reminds me back when I, in my thesis, when I went back from the QHM, now we call it QHM, at that time we call it DSM or something like that, to simple harmonic plus noise model, now, here from the quasi-harmonic model and all this work that I present you, Gilles wanted to go to the harmonic model again. So this is how we ended up with another model called adaptive full-band harmonic model that has been recently um, um, published in the transactions. But I have not talked about that. I've talked about only the quasi-harmonic model and try to give you the, the, why this model works, to show you the mechanism of the quasi-harmonic model, of the diproni model, because we, underst we understand now why it works and how this understanding can be extended and help us in modeling speech. For what applications? It's up to you. I'm done with that. So... This is uh, references. I give some references uh, during my talk. Uh, so this is the, uh, um, the quadratic uh, interpolated fast Fourier transform from Abby and Julius O. Smith. I don't know why LaTeX did not uh, wrote Julius O. Smith, the third. And then some other papers from Jean Laroche when he revisited the Diproni model. Of course, the book from, uh, I, I, will, I will say that uh, later on. Uh, then the papers that uh, I already mentioned. And that was also a collaboration with Olivier Rozek, who, is, who was in, at France Telecom, and uh, now he's in Voxygen, a speech synthesis uh, startup that came out from uh, France Telecom. And uh, I have used during my talk uh, some figures, especially during the production and the Saint-Jean model, etc., from Thomas Quatieri's book uh, on discrete time speech signal processing from Pretting's Hall. And that I, I've got the permission from Thomas and from Pretting's Hall to use this, uh, these figures in my slides. So I'd like to thank them uh, for providing me uh, this, uh, I mean, the permission to give me the permission to do so, and my students who worked on this topic and make that uh, great job. Yoros Kafedzis, uh, it was, as I said, uh, working on the extended um, quasi-harmonic model. Um, today is his first day in the military service, so we wish him good luck. Um, and I'd like to thank again Tom uh, Quatieri and Pretty School to give me the permission to use the figures from Tom's book. And you, because that is uh, probably heavy signal processing course in summer, first day. I apologize. <laughs> but at the same, I hope I gave you motivation to revisit the slides. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer now, later on with emails, and I invite you to show to come to the hands-on uh, session to see really by using your own eyes and hands to believe or not to this nice model okay thank you very much